Welcome back to another episode of The Founder, a show that features entrepreneurs and their early stories of ingenuity, struggle, and perseverance to get their companies off the ground. We do our best to capture the uncensored, uncovered look behind the curtain into what founders really face when getting started. I'm your host, Callaway. My guests today are a dynamic duo power couple who met during their time studying at GIA, the Gemological Institute of America. A few years after graduating from gem school, they started noticing a lot of their friends were looking to get engaged and would often ask them for help, tips, and even to design their custom rings. What initially started as an educational blog to help people better understand the do's and don'ts of ring buying quickly turned into a frenzy on the internet with people from all over the world wanting custom rings and jewelry. That frenzy was called the clear cut. At the clear cut, these founders and their team have built a direct to consumer diamond engagement ring and fine jewelry powerhouse. They've taken what has traditionally been known as a mysterious pay-to-play industry and completely disrupted it, adding a layer of amazing customer service and transparency with their customers. Their goal, one which I think they're well on their way to achieving, is to be the end-to-end jewelry brand for the digital age. This was an inspiring interview that taught me a ton about the diamond industry and shed light on one of the best new brands in the space. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Without further ado, the co-founders of The Clear Cut, Olivia Landau and Kyle Simon. Let's get it. Kyle and Olivia, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. For sure. I'm really looking forward to this. So before we dive into kind of the, the origin story and how you've grown the business, I like to start out with just an anchor point. So can you can you provide a little snapshot in terms of kind of what the company looks like today, mission, vision, size, employees, things like that? Yeah, so the clear cut is a direct to consumer diamond engagement and fine jewelry company. We work with clients to pick out their perfect diamond and create a custom ring. And we also have a collection of fine jewelry that is made to order here in New York City. And we've been around since 2018, and we have about seven employees at the moment. Yeah. So let's kind of rewind the clock a bit. I'd love to to walk through kind of your your life and background leading up to starting the clear cut. So you know, where do you guys go to school? I know you both have gemology backgrounds. What do you work on, projects wise, job wise, leading up to it? I come from a long line of diamond cutters and dealers. My dad's side of the family is from Antwerp, Belgium, which used to be the diamond capital of the world. And my mom and my dad started their own antique jewelry business. So I kind of grew up around diamonds and gemstones my entire life. I never thought I would personally get into it because they always told me it was kind of like a dying business and I should just go to college and get a corporate job. But after graduating from NYU, I didn't really know what I wanted to do as a career, and I was always a bit interested in the jewelry industry. So I decided to enroll in GIA, which is the Gemological Institute of America, right after graduating um, for a six-month program, and that was to become a gemologist, and that's where I met Kyle. Yeah, and so I come from like a totally different background, so I'm not from a fourth-generation diamond family. Um, but I graduated college, I grew up in Chicago, and then I actually moved to Sierra Leone in West Africa. Um, and I worked in politics there, um, which was a a wild experience and its own story in its own right. Um, but after that, I saw a country that was developing and on the right track and I knew people in the right places. And I had an opportunity to start a fair trade diamond mining company, but I didn't know very much about diamonds at the time. So my investors in that venture actually sent me to diamond school, like GIA, which is where I met Olivia. And so at school, did you guys start to realize there was an opportunity, like friends were coming to you asking for for these types of rings or, or, you know, did you spend some time at school and then what happened after that? It wasn't until after. So right after GIA, my first job in the industry was at Tiffany on their engagement floor. And that's where I really fell in love with like bridal, um, engagement rings. And then um, after that, I started working at a really large diamond wholesale company. At the same time, Kyle, um, his company kind of... Basically, um, (laughs) it's my second time starting a business during a pandemic. So I was in Sierra Leone (laughs) during Ebola. Um, And so fast forward a few years, I returned from Sierra Leone and then that venture wasn't really successful. 
um, and went to business school at Columbia. And then while I was at Columbia, there was this like phenomenon that like everyone in business school between the first and second year starts thinking about getting engaged. Yep. Um, and everyone's like, do you know a guy? Like you work in the industry, you need to know a guy. And I was like, yeah, like Olivia's that guy. <laughs> Um, so it was during that time when I was working in wholesale, a lot of our friends started wanting to get engaged and they'd come to me and I'd educate them, help them pick out their diamonds and design their custom rings. And then I realized that most people didn't know the first thing about buying a diamond. So I decided to start the clear cut as just an educational blog that was meant for our friends to kind of read up on the do's and don'ts before coming to work with us. And then I started posting some of the designs on Instagram. And that's really where it took off. And this was in January of 2016 when I started the Clear Cut blog. And then from the Instagram, a lot of people from across the country and world started following the account and then um, asked if I could help you know, make their custom rings. So it kind of started as like a hobby and then turned into a side hustle. And I had become a gemologist somewhere else and was running back and forth to the diamond district before work, after work, during lunch, um, you know, selling hundreds of thousands of dollars of engagement rings. So if you were to like sum up the difference between like what you guys offer as a service versus if someone was were to go to like the big box store versus like a private jeweler, they might not know. What are some of those key differences? Because I know you've had a ton of success, so there must be a few. Yeah. So I think how we try to view the industry as a whole is there's like the online marketplaces, there's traditional brick and mortar retail. And then there's like Noah guy, like mom and pop kind of style of situation. Um, so the online marketplaces like are very much like internet like 1.0 companies where the whole thesis around them is complete optionality, like total choice, hundreds of thousands of diamonds, which is really overwhelming and confusing even for like diamond experts like ourselves. Um, so there's like no like personalization, there's no curation. It's, it's really- a really personal and expensive purchase with a lot more, you know, significance than any other piece of jewelry. So it's a kind of sterile experience if you go to the marketplace. And then you have the brick and mortar retail, which is like dramatically overpriced. And often you're just being pushed something that's like in someone's inventory by a salesperson who might not even be that sophisticated or aware of the product themselves. Um, so with the clear cut, everything we do is custom. It's made here in New York. You deal with a one-on-one with a ge- graduate gemologist. So how our process works, it's kind of like you have your own personal diamond expert and it's kind of a concierge service. So whenever someone wants to start the process, they just schedule a phone consultation and they talk directly to me or one of our gemologists about their goals, their preferences, their price point. So we get to know them and what they want. And then we'll hand pick a selection of diamonds specifically for that client. We'll pre-scan each diamond to make sure it's something that, you know, we would want to wear ourselves. It's of the highest quality within each grade. And then from there, create a custom ring. Yeah, and each diamond we specifically like have in our hand, we look at it, but at the same time, it's not like in our inventory. So we have no incentive to push you something that's been sitting in a safe. If you don't like a diamond, we're happy to figure out why and get you that that perfect diamond. It's like teamwork. Yeah, and I think that from a price situation, we are as competitive as anybody. Yeah, that that's a question I had is peeling back the layer. Most people wouldn't understand like the wholesale process. Like when you pick a selection, like a small selection to then give people as options, what does that look like? Are you going to the wholesale supplier in New York City? Is there like an inventory that only private jewelers have access to? Like how does that, how does that work? So we partner with some of the largest diamond manufacturers, cutters, wholesalers, and estates for like our antique stones, um, just depending on what the actual clients' preferences are. And we're fortunate that I worked in wholesale previously and was able to garner a lot of great relationships in the industry. And also um, my family has introduced us to, you know, different suppliers as well. So we're able to kind of cut through a lot of layers and get them, you know, the diamond directly. Yeah. And I think what really helped us grow in the early days is initially it was our network and it was people in New York City. But what we quickly realized is across the United States, there's Outside of like New York, maybe LA, Chicago a little bit, um, 
there isn't like we call them like diamond deserts. There, there are these areas of the country where there's so many middlemen. By the time it gets to that person in Seattle, or St. Louis, or Dallas, or et cetera, um, that the prices aren't competitive, and the experience certainly isn't competitive to ours. So I'm curious, and I and I'll, I want to get to that later around like your growth strategy. But are you able to serve people that are in like the Midwest that don't have you know direct consumer brands? Yes. So 80% of all of our clients are completely remote um, right now, 100%, but it's always been um, the focus. We don't have traditional retail. We do have a by appointment only showroom here in New York, but we really wanted to double down on the remote experience because that's where we think that we provide a lot of value. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm curious around like the customer profile. So I feel like I would imagine that the buyer of a diamond engagement ring in 1980 knows a lot less and different things than the buyer today. How do those profiles vary? And like when someone comes to you, what type of information do they know? Like size, cut, specs versus what don't they know that you have to educate them on? So I think it's changed a lot in the past couple of years. Um, The longer we've been on Instagram um, making our educational content, um, our clients are pretty informed. They know exactly kind of what they're looking for. They've been searching online, on social media, um, and they want what they want at a price that, you know, they think is fair. And we're very transparent with our pricing. So I'd say it's really um, the couples working together more than just, you know, a guy coming in with no clue and just getting something and like hoping that his partner loves it. Right now, it's a lot of couples working together and a lot of the women knowing exactly what they want. Yeah, I think in terms of like the historical like evolution of the industry, it's really interesting because like you mentioned 1980, right? Like before the internet, your choices to understand diamonds were either to like trust the salesperson blindly, trust a family member or like go to the library, you know, like those were your actual choices. And now today's customers are incredibly sophisticated, very aware. So we try to like augment that. There's almost too much information for the customer. And we try to like cut through the noise and tell them what does matter, what doesn't matter, and really empower them to make the right decisions for themselves. If you were like play Mythbuster, what are some things that people come to you, like assumptions or like facts that they think are true that just aren't true? I would say that like diamonds are totally unaffordable. A lot of times you know, we'll get these funny comments being like, oh, that diamond's like at least a million dollars because whenever a celebrity gets engaged, you always see like, oh, this costs like $5 million. I'm like, yeah, that was probably like 30,000, you know, not 5 million, a little bit of an exaggeration. So we're fed a lot of misinformation about pricing, quality. A lot of people like, don't I need a D flawless, which is like the top, top quality. It's like, not if you're going to wear this ring every day. It's not something that you're like putting in the safe. So that's also um, a misconception, I would say. Yeah, I think people just around budget in general, people like, is it two month salary? Is it this? Is it that? And it's a totally personal decision. And some couples value it more than others. And and it, there's nothing wrong with either direction. Yeah. And a lot of women are contributing financially mm-hmm. to the ring now as well. That's kind of what's changing. Too. Yeah, that's probably like a newer trend for sure. Yeah. yeah. I want to talk about your, you guys were in Techstars mm-hmm. and you you did that accelerator program, mm-hmm. which is which is really interesting um, in terms of all the learning you have, you compress all that learning into such a short time. Can you talk about like in three stages, why do you decide to go into that program? What do you get out of it and kind of what went on during it? Yeah, so when Kyle was finishing up business school, that's when I was doing the clear cut as a side hustle. And it was coming a little overwhelming where I couldn't really balance doing that and a full-time job. So Kyle being very entrepreneurial and having started his own company before recognized this and was like, Hey, we should quit our jobs and just go all in on the clear cut. But I'm a little bit more risk adverse. So I really wanted to do an accelerated program or some sort of, you know, boot campy program. Techstars does give you a little bit of seed funding and a ton of help and direction and networking. So it was very desirable, even though we weren't like a traditional tech company. Yeah. And then in terms of like how the program went, it was like broken up into three parts. It's like mentorship, um, action, the growth. And then in fundraising, 
Um, and I think each part served us really well. I think what was particularly special about it for us was the MD, Alex. Um, we grew really close with him. He's a multiple time founder and now he owns his own VC fund. And he's usually our first call when anything goes wrong or well. Um, and just having someone like that who's seen it before and can like identify things like that has been tremendous. When you think about like how the business looked going into it and then coming out, what was the major differences other than like, of course, the strategic frameworks and things like that on the back end? I mean, I didn't know what I was doing going into it. Like I had some luck in making some sales over Instagram, but I didn't know how to run a business. I didn't even know what a KPI was going in. I was like, Kyle, what's a KPI? Like (laughs) we didn't have a website you could buy jewelry on. We had done, I think, close to a million dollars in sales prior to joining. But we only had a blog. So some people like didn't know that we could actually sell products. So yeah, wow. Well, that's a good problem to have. (laughs) It went from like scrappy side hustle, like impressive number thing that no one was sure what it was to a company. Yeah. I don't think we had a bank account. No, we couldn't get a bank <laughs> we account. We couldn't get a bank account because we like filed all paperwork wrong. wrong. Yeah, that's crazy. You had that much traction just, you know, just like slinging on Instagram. Well, yeah. I think and that was a challenge. It was like tech stars is like, you're not a tech company, but you have like a lot of revenue. And we accepted a lot of tech companies that have no revenue. So like maybe we can turn you into a tech company and have the other people turn into like revenue producing companies <laughs> and like call it a day. Uh, it, to that point, were you able to kind of like share some some like key learnings that you had that some of these other companies just because they're not in direct consumer, they're not in retail, which I know you weren't in yet, but you were thinking about it. Were you able to teach them a lot of the things that you had learned so far? Yeah, I think it was like you view it as like innate to you, Olivia, sometimes where you just like think it's like obviously you do this on social media. But I think a lot of people had like no social media like strategy. And a lot of people when you are launching a business, their social media strategy is to, you know, buy a bunch of followers and make sure like everything looks so perfect. And like the grid is like, perfect looking and how I like to interact with social media is something very like, authentic and relatable and, you know, transparent, something fun. Um, And that's kind of still like our ethos around like our social media strategy. So I want to I want to talk about marketing and like tactics i like to get tactical on the show and you guys are one of the best i've ever seen at social marketing so can you talk through like what are some of the things that you do that you think you do differently than most of the people you see on instagram that's working or any social channel and and kind of how you thought about it and and grow that well like i said a lot of people when they try to create content for instagram whether it be a jewelry company or any other direct consumer Um, company, everyone wants to have everything be perfect. And you know, all their grid on their Instagram, like all match each other. And that's just not realistic. And I think what we do differently is that we're really authentic. And we're taking this really luxury product that's very expensive, but making it in a way that you know, people can relate to it's on my hand, not edited shot on an iPhone. That's like how people are going to be wearing it. It's not like floating in some really photoshopped, like white background, you know, like how a lot of like luxury jewelry companies um, have done a lot of their marketing in the past where it seems very unattainable, kind of stuffy. Um, We kind of do it in a way that you can see how, you know, if you were to get this type of ring or this piece of jewelry, how you can wear it every single day, um, be super transparent and have, you know, talk directly to our audience. Like today is our Wednesday Q and A. So we open up for questions and, you know, no questions too dumb or too small, like we'll answer anything. And it's just about learning, um, communicating with our community, um, taking, you know, their suggestions and, creating content based on that. So when we get a lot of the same questions, we'll take that and make like a longer form IGTV video called our clear cut classroom. And also when people get engaged, we do our clear cut couples. So highlighting their proposal stories. So it's just like community building, being really authentic, being real and yeah, attainable 
luxury that isn't intimidating. Yeah, and I think what's also like important to caveat about that is while like we stress this like kind of raw, like uncurated, like more organic kind of vibe, at the same time, it's like very like intentionally so. And there is like a structure and like consistency behind that. So all those programs Olivia has mentioned, like every Monday is our podcast. Every Tuesday is our clear cut couple. Every Wednesday is Wednesday Q&A. We then take those questions. We get like hundreds of questions every Wednesday, turn them into like product launch ideas. And like we get trends like directly from our community every Thursday. Yeah, the reason why we even launched our collection was just based on feedback from existing clients and our um, people in our online community asking us for, you know, pieces after their engagement rings or things that they could wear if they weren't in getting engaged, you know, they just wanted to interact with the brand. And so, you know, we realized that after the engagement ring, a lot of people get their wedding bands. So that's how it started rolling out. And then just more fun, fine jewelry pieces that they could buy for other occasions. Yeah. Is your strategy like you want to be the go-to provider for engagement and then this kind of, you know, the private line you launched was like icing on the cake, like an added bonus or were you thinking about it like the end goal was always to have your like private collection, which is probably higher margin and the engagement ring piece, a little bit lower margin, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, was like to build the base, like to build the community. Our goal is to be this generation's jeweler for life so how if you grew up in a small town there was one jewelry store that's been there for hundreds of years and your grandparents got the ring there and then their parents and you know for all the anniversaries you go there we want to be that for the millennial customer in all across the country not just in your you know town or city or whatever. yeah i mean the engagement ring is generally one of the most expensive purchases of a person's life it's an incredibly important significant milestone in their life um, and so if you can build that trust on that l- l- high price point and that big moment and someone trust in you not to screw that up for them, um, hopefully you've built up pretty. We, we always say that the engagement ring is the gateway drug to all your fine jewelry purchases. I love that. I'm curious. So like, you know, p- people are able to paint this amazing picture on, on social media, which is great. And it sounds like listening to your story, the business is doing super well in almost every area. If someone were to like lift the hood up, what are some of the struggles or frustrations you've had you know, from a business side that an average customer just might not see? Um, There's a lot. I think one, um, Olivia and I didn't necessarily know how to manage people. Um, and uh, so still, like we're still, still yeah, 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 still. yeah. So it's just like one of those things where, you know. It's the scaling part that's yeah. tricky because you know how to do things a certain way or I, I feel confident that if I do it, like I trust myself, but at a certain point, you can't do everything yourself and you need to train people and trust that they're, you know, representing the brand and, you know, the customer service the way you would want to. And that's, um, that's I mean, now we're at a point where like training people to train people. Yeah. And that's like a whole, like we thought we figured out how to train somebody and now it's like, okay, now you need to train someone else. And that's like, so yeah, that's challenging. I mean, I think there are just so many elements of the business that we weren't experts in. Like we are our packaging, like we weren't experts in that, like our like website, web development, I think finding, finding talents always been really challenging, but what we've been fortunate about is everyone who we have brought on has been like a rock star. And yeah, recognizing when you don't know how to do something and that someone else else may know how to do it better and putting your trust and confidence in them. No, I totally agree. I I have a few questions on hiring that I want to get to a little bit later, but I think you echoed a lot of it. It seems like that's one of the most critical things. If you can get that right, if you can get rock stars who exhibit the brand, who do things to the level of quality you expect, like that's how you grow the business. And if on the flip side, if you can't, you're going to really sputter like at, to, once you get to a certain point. Yeah. yeah. And like our first hire is our head of product now, Sarah, shout out to Sarah, has been like a game changer in our success and had, would enabled us to get to where we are today. Um, and without that first hire being so, we were so right on, it might have been a different path. Yeah. I mean, now that we're talking about it, I want to ask the questions now, like what, what are the key characteristics that you look for when you're bringing someone on? Obviously, technical ability, if, if they're going to be a social media strategist, they have to know that. But like what... What general things are you looking for? We need to deal with people who are very comfortable working in ambiguous situations and are willing to take ownership of work, even if they're not necessarily qualified for it. <laughs> um, and I think that's a, a lot of people who come from like a corporate job are used to like being given a task or a very narrow set of responsibilities. And it's like you like all hands on deck, like literally, like we might like take your hand, like what size finger are you? Like we need this for the photo. Yeah. So it's like to that level of like, you know, flexibility. Also more than, you know, technical ability, someone that is super hardworking and, you know, willing to 
um, do whatever they can to learn and get better for like the entire team, like, and be part of the team. Um, that's. And there's a delicate balance where you need to be this like go getter, ambitious, like, you know, break things, move fast kind of vibe, but also we're dealing with like incredibly expensive, small things. So like you have to be very, very detail oriented. Like if yeah. you misplace a diamond, like that's an issue. Yeah. Like don't yeah, break anything. Exactly. Really. <laughs> or like yeah. you like put a zero off on an invoice. Like that's a huge problem. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it's a combination. So we need people who are very detail oriented as well. Yeah. And, and a question I like to ask, which I think you, you mentioned a little bit already, but like, who is your most underrated hire where they came, if it's not Sarah, you can shout out someone else here. Like when they came in, they either, you hired them for a certain task in the, or a role and they came in and just killed it in like a bunch of other areas, or it was like a, a gap that you had in terms of expertise or, and, and you hired someone and they just filled it really well. Well, our newest hire, yeah, Natalie, so she came on as an intern last summer and she was, she was just graduated like this week from college. So she was in college. Um, and we hired her to do like marketing analytics. We weren't really sure what we hired her for. We just like needed a body. And, and we're like, she, she seems smart. Like, she came in and we we're like, oh, we're thinking about doing a podcast, like maybe like do some research on it. And she like learned how to do a podcast and like bought all the equipment and like filmed and edited and learned how to edit like our videos and just like came in and like yeah, killed, killed it. it. And yeah. now she's our head of brand. Yeah. And she, and she, at this point, even though she's like much younger than probably most head of brands, she's, she's exceptional. Yeah. And- I'm, I'm curious, like from a competitive landscape. So you already talked about like, you've got the old big box shops, you've got the online. It seems like, it's logical that the space you guys are in is is where it's at, where the demand will funnel to. Are there other players that are popping up in basically a competitive type landscape to you? And what's that look like? Yeah. So at the end of the day, our number one competitor, even to this day, is the local mom and pop jewelry store. Like they have a lot of traction and they do really, really well. They're, they're dying. There are hundreds of them closing every year. Yeah, um, but more and more we're seeing like more jewelry companies pop up like on social media, like new ones every single day. And I think, you know, this space is changing so much and the industry is going through a dramatic shift. So the way my parents sold jewelry and their clientele no longer exists. And that's why they said that this was a dying industry. But it's really not a dying industry. It's just dramatically changing. So we're going to see a lot more people doing, you know, remote work or things similar to us. But at the end of the day, I think that everyone has like their own niche, things that they're specialized in. And, you know, at the end, it's like all about what you can deliver to your clients yeah. and their customers. I think something that's interesting about competition just generally is when you first start a business, you're very scared of it. Um, just because like you came up with this great idea. Once if someone knocks you off or if someone does it better. But what I think you realize is competition allows you to have a voice and to define like what you're not and what you are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think honestly, if you're in a space where there's no, like jewelry is competitive. Like if you're in a space that there's no competition, it can lead you astray more than if you're in a hyper competitive space, you need to know exactly who you are and what you stand for. Yeah. And this is always going to be a competitive space. Um, it's just, yeah, like Kyle said, it kind of helps us define who we are, what we want to represent and how we want to be different. So from the growth in the industry on the consumer side, I'm, I'm pretty certain engagement rings will be a thing for a long time. But like, do you see in 10 years, are people going to buy more jewelry or less? And like, do, how do you think that will change? Well, what we're seeing already is women are buying themselves a lot more jewelry than ever before. So jewelry used to be gifted by men to women. That's flipped on its head where women are buying themselves things for like getting a promotion or for having a kid, whatever it may be. Um, so we're seeing more and more, I think, uh, just a change of who's buying jewelry. And then when women are buying jewelry for themselves, it's kind of easier to design because you know, like who you're designing for, like the end buyer. And we're seeing a lot of people actually our fine jewelry collection is one of the fastest growing parts of our business. So I think people are, um, continuing to buy jewelry for, you know, occasions every day. And also I think taking the time to invest in fine jewelry, um, instead of a ton of like smaller costume pieces, which was a trend in the past. I think now people are saving up to buy, you know, real gold, real diamonds, real gemstones. A question around like what people are buying today. I think my girlfriend will kill me if I don't ask this. Like in terms of like shape, like oval versus circle and then size ranges, what is the average that you're seeing 
not, not even average, but like what's popular these days? How's that break down with the consumers today? Right now, um, and there you can like really see trends um, come and go. Right now, um, what's really popular, and it's been popular for a few years now, is the oval shape. Um, ever since Blake Lively got engaged, which was quite a few years back, it has just gained more and more popularity, probably because it's a really finger flattering shape and also one that shows its weight well. Um, round brilliants are always going to be the most popular cut. It's the most classic, um, never goes out of style. What we've seen actually is a lot of people really liking antique cuts like old mines and old Europeans. I think something about the history of it being a few hundred years old and each one looking a bit different um, really, you know, draws people um, in. But like a lot of times it does have to do with a lot of celebrity trends. Like after Emily Ratajkowski got engaged with her two stone ring, we've seen a lot of toi et moi, which is like the two stone type of engagement rings. So it kind of depends. Now a lot of tiny um, thin bands are super skinny. Solitaire is like our most popular setting. And yellow gold has made a huge comeback from a few years ago. Um, so yeah, we're seeing a little bit of trends taking off and kind of holding uh their force that's that's great i'm i'm i've heard a lot about the ovals <laughs> so i'm, <laughs> ovals I'm are glad great. i got that right <laughs> yeah if you think about five to ten years from now where do you want the clear cut to be what do you want it to look like how big do you want it to be what's the vision yeah i mean we want to be this generation's jeweler for life um we're working on some technology right now that hopefully will allow us to scale a bit more than the, the current process we're in um but we really want to redefine the way people buy jewelry online and how people celebrate occasions through jewelry yeah and when people think engagement rings they think the clear cut oh and they just think education when they think they need a leader in the space and they want someone who is like a peer who's giving them advice how they would like go to a friend or go to whoever they know they can go to a trusted source that's going to empower them to make the right decision for them and, and get the most value if you're allowed to talk about it what's that technology gonna look like like what's it gonna do how's it gonna help you right now like i said there's um about 80 percent of our clients are completely remote so we have like a remote process that we've kind of been growth hacking through email and you know little feedback boxes and we're basically taking our remote process but making it a lot more elegant for the client and um more functional for our gemologists on the back end as yes. well yeah that's awesome call tech stars up <laughs> tell them exactly hey we're yeah. We finally they would be there. They are the most excited. They're, they're a little more aware of what we're building, and I think it was, should launch. I want to say I don't want to jinx it, but like mid July. I don't know. It's it's a lot harder um, than I thought yeah, it was going to be. But when it launches, um, I think it's going to be a, an important moment for us. Yeah. So you guys are rare in that you get to work together, and and really, it's you're probably never off. It's like personal yeah. life and business life always together. What's that like? What are what what's awesome about it? What are some challenges? So one of the things I always say right away is people are like, "How is that possible?" Like, and I think it just like depends on couple to couple. Like, I think in our relationship, how like I spent my summer between first and second year of business school working at Goldman Sachs. I think that lifestyle would be much more challenging to our relationship than actually spending all day every day together. Um, so I think it depends on the couple right from the jump in terms of, um, we're pretty used to it. Um, and I think that what's great about us is that we have very differing skill sets and a lot of respect for each other's skill sets. So, you know, what Kyle's really good at in the business, I'm not, and I don't try to like challenge him on it or step on his toes and vice versa. So that's, where it works to our benefit. It's also really cool that, you know, we get to like build this thing together that we're both really, really passionate about. And although we're always talking about it and it's kind of like our child, um, I think it's kind of romantic to build that together and have, and I'm glad we have like a similar vision. And we actually together. started this prior to even getting married or anything. Yeah. So we were just dating. Um, we were just dating. It was very difficult to, Tell that and I think what's interesting is like, yeah, and we were like terrified of telling investors and like try to keep it on like the DL, <laughs> but I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. I think you should be, I mean, I, I mean, I think some investors would tell the opposite, but if they have a problem with it, they're going to have a problem with it and they're going to find out about it. I think it's, if, if anything, it's better to be in a relationship because you like... Yeah, it's transparency. Yeah, like, yeah and you know that you're committed you know you're to... Because that's the thing there's about... There's a lot of co-founder issues if you're not in a relationship. Yeah, I mean, like, the two ways a startup fails is it runs out of money or the co-founders, like, fight, right? And, you know, regardless of the dynamic, any non, 
you know, dating or married co-founders, there is an end one day to that relationship, right? Which means at a certain moment or fork in the road, road, there's going to be a moment where like incentives don't align or like timelines don't align or exit strategies don't align. And so if you're not necessarily dating your co-founder, I think you really need to be clear um, on what the end goals are of that relationship. So a question to that, I guess it's like a two-parter. One, like during the day, do you guys find that you kind of split up, like you're, you know, Kyle's focusing on something, Olivia's focusing on something, and you meet back up for lunch and like sync on it, or are you a lot close, more closely intertwined? Like every, you know, I mean, every big meeting, you're probably both on it, but you know, you, you sync a lot more during the day. I would say we're pretty separate during the day. I mean, COVID has, has changed that a bit. Um, but I think there's a lot of time, like us at home is when we really sync on everything that's happened. And obviously, like, yeah, the big decisions were both there. Well, but even working from home, we were, we're working out of different physical spaces. Different yeah, yeah, that's true. We actually work yeah. out of different physical spaces. And even like on our all hands call, like Olivia's on her computer, I'm on my computer. And it's like so we have two, rooms, yeah. two different voices even, I think, which is valuable as well. Yeah. Do you find it easy to unplug at all like disconnect from the business like at night at all or do you even want to do that i'm really good at that yeah i'm not so so she like forces me to do that i'm really good i'm like okay work's done this is like my time to cook and like work out and what and chill watch tv and kyle will just like come in and in the middle of my show be like you know what i was thinking about this thing and i'm like whoa yeah yeah so I, I think we used to when things when things were really busy, like pre COVID, um, we tried to have every Saturday like no work discussed, and like we broke that rule more often than not. But at least like that was like an aspirational. Or I'd be like, I'm not answering emails for one sat, like just Saturday. I'm not answering yeah. emails. You know, it's probably so hard because when you when you're the owner of the business, like the more you put in, the more you get out, and like you guys are holding each other accountable all the time. Like one of you can't just wake up Saturday morning and do emails, and the other one not feel bad. Yeah. Well, sometimes. Kyle will, and I'm just like, I don't feel bad. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> What's the biggest or a couple lessons learned that you've taken away from an investor pitch? Um, have you ever like got burned by an investor? Or, like, you know, what have you I think to- just you don't, I mean, and this is coming from people who maybe aren't the most successful, you know, those people I'm sure who've raised a lot more money than us. Um, but I yes, think there are. there are. I think um, just be yourself. I think the more you try to act and trick people and like, also like you know your business so if someone's giving you advice that you may not agree on like you don't have to listen to them yeah i think it's challenging because there's so many like iconic investors out there so many intelligent people in the investment community and like while they may be intelligent they don't necessarily understand your business like if we just like follow like the typical vc playbook for like d to c like we've seen other jewelry companies rise and fall that have been raised a lot of money doing those exact playbooks and it doesn't work in our space. And there's like reasons for that, that are like unique to this industry and you need to kind of be aware. Yeah. Not to change like your values or your vision just based on a specific investor. Yeah. And what, what was your guys' approach to raising money? Cause I feel like you were so successful early on. You, you had to have, you know, some profits in the bank yeah. already. So when did you raise and, and why did you raise? So when we got into tech stars, they gave us one twenty, um, which was, nice and we didn't touch it ever um i think to this date we never touched it um and then when we graduated the program like one of the big milestones for techstars is raising a big round i think out of the program and like a lot of our classmates did and some of them have raised i think what typing dna is in over 10 million dollars at this point um so some of our classmates have raised huge amounts of money we never had the need to do that i think at the same time we didn't uh, want to give up too much ownership and we didn't want someone telling us what to do if they didn't understand what was going on in the business. Yeah. But there was like a, there was like a push pull at the same time, like Olivia and I are a bit conservative um, because we, we were dealing with such like tight, like finances to begin with that having just money in the bank allowed us to take risks that we probably just should have done anyways. Um, so we had a small round of angels. primarily angels, um, half of which became customers, which I thought was really cool because it showed like they understood the product. Um, and some of them are strategic and work in entertainment and things like that. Um, so very non-traditional round, but very, right out of tech stars. very suitable for what we, what we wanted. Mm-hmm. As you guys grow, do you think it's going to be one of those things that you're going to need to pour gasoline on the fire? Like, you know, the model, you, you will know how to acquire customers. You're going to have the tech layer. Like, do you just raise a one big round and just blow it up or are you still going to kind of grow the way you're going it's something we we struggle, we with. struggle with and we've been approached uh multiple times for like sizable rounds from in 
people that we've all heard of um, and we don't know what to tell them. <laughs> so yeah. we, um, we understand what that, that there's no such thing as like a free lunch, like taking that kind of money changes the dynamic. And a lot of those same people gave us really bad advice for our industry initially. And so we're like, the, now you're coming back to us telling us like everything you're doing is correct. And we're going to keep it that way and just want to give you some money. And it's like, well, do you like, so um, yeah, that's something that we think about and um, not right now, but maybe I'm not saying no in the near future. I think we're lucky and it's also served us well during COVID where we were never really dependent on paid growth. Um, so we spent, oh, thank God. Yeah. And so I think, I think you're going to see a lot of DC companies like that. They're going to struggle with that at the moment. Um, but everything was so organic. And so, you know, at the end of the day, like I think the most viral and the most successful companies are grown through word of mouth. Um, you know, like most pro- there are people, you know, you buy some products because you saw a Facebook ad. More than not, it's because your friend told you, like, this thing's really cool. You should check it out. Yeah. Um, and I think we do a great job with that. I, I totally agree with that, like, friend friend recommendation. I was going to ask this earlier, but were there any, like, interesting out-of-the-box marketing ideas you tried that didn't work? It sounds like a lot of what you've done has I mean, worked. I think influencer gifting didn't really work for us at all. I mean, um, I guess that's not so out-of-the-box because no. everyone does that. But that didn't work for us at all. Um, and we have such an expensive product. So it was like, we really, um, it was not like a small investment, but I think people, you know, they can kind of see through a lot of things that now, like an influencer, like their whole life is just like selling things they're paid to sell. So it's very different than if like your friend who doesn't have that many followers recommends something, you probably will still buy it over someone with like 2 million followers who's just promoting a new person every single day. And on the flip side, I would say our podcast has been very successful and it doesn't really make sense why a jewelry company has a podcast, but it works and it helps build our community. Well, it's because I we were on we were on a lot of like or I was on a lot of podcasts about female entrepreneurship and I thought it was so cool, you know, learning about um other women's stories and their, you know, sparks and challenges and all of that. And I just wanted to grow our female community. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily relate to jewelry, but we do talk about it and it's been, um, it's been fun and it's been a successful way to get more eyeballs on the clear cut and introduce people to other women's audiences as well. Yeah. I mean, what I really like about you guys is you're, you're authentically building an organic community, whereas like a a big influencer that lives and dies by their Instagram presence, like you said, they're, they're pushing product all day. You guys are the thought leaders in the space. You're not pushing product. It just, the products that you talk about, you also Mm -hmm. sell. It's like that, that seems why it's working well. And a a question around like, to, to go back to what you were talking about, like investors and mentors, what's the best piece of advice you've gotten from a mentor? It sounds like you've gotten some bad ones, but like, what's, what's one, a good piece of advice you've gotten? I would say, um, when we first got into tech stars, I was just, paralyzed by wanting everything to be perfect. I was like, Oh my God, like if we're going to relaunch the site, it has to be perfect. So I, the takeaway was, you know, if you're not embarrassed by, you know, the first version or your first launch, then you waited too long and keeping that in mind, just throwing things out there, testing things, always changing, improving, you know, getting 5% better every single day. Um, that's something that has really helped me with growing the clear cut. And because sometimes like at, what perfect is the enemy of better. Yeah. I mean, we, we, I look back on a lot of things we've done and I'm embarrassed by them, but at the same Super time, I'm happy that we did them when we did them, you know, I'm probably embarrassed by whatever we have going on right now. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> So another question I like to ask is if you could teleport back to the first couple months when you guys were starting out, what would you tell yourself then? Good question. I would tell myself to give myself a little bit more credit and believe in myself more. And then I know more than I think I do. Yeah, I would. Something along those lines. I mean, I would maybe. I mean, you know, you have a lot of confidence in yourself. I have confidence, but it'd be nice to know that I was it was founded on something. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it would just be just it would, the hard work would pay off. I yeah. Think. Cause there's just so much uncertainty when you're starting and you like threw away like your whole life and job and you're like, Oh my God, like all my eggs are in one basket, like mine and Kyle's. So my parents were like a little bit, both our, yeah, both our parents were like furious <laughs> that, we, that we did this. It was like, a, yeah, yeah well, that's the interesting thing is you guys have like double the risk, but also double yeah. the upside. Like every investor you take is diluting yeah. both of you inherently, but it's like one pie. So th- those decisions like matter even that yeah. much now more for you yeah. guys. What would you say like is your biggest challenge right now? Like what keeps you up at night growth wise? 
scaling with and you... scaling and building this technology for a remote process where it still feels personal and it's not feeling too um impersonal I mean. impersonal or automatic um so keeping that personal feel while being able to scale you know like having that touch that we're known for and like that teamwork that we have in that relationship with the client, but still being able to grow and scale beyond what we're doing. Now. Yeah. Like people have always been like, you know, you can't have a gemologist assigned to each person and look at each diamond. And it's like, we can, if one, the yields of those interactions are very high where those people end up buying. And then two, if um, those gemologists are not stuck doing a lot of busy work and like BS behind the scenes. So it's like, how do we automate every other part of their job so that they can really focus on what they're exceptional at and give and exceptional customers? customer service mm -hmm. and then how do we make sure that when we interact with customers we vetted them or put them through a process enough that by the time they reach that stage they have a high consideration to purchase yeah no that's a, that's a great way to look at it like you almost need enough demand where like every 15 minute slot for the gymnologist is full yeah. and like that's all they do all day but if you don't have enough demand then it's like what are they doing for half the day exactly. and i guess recently like covid's kind of been keeping me up yeah that, that was that i mean initially that it, it was terrifying you know um but now I think it gives us kind of some confidence that like we're no, we surviving in, 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 I think, hopefully a once in a lifetime <laughs> environment. Do you think it's interesting that like there's a lot of people getting engaged right now during mm -hmm. this time that mm -hmm. like can't be with their friends and family? Like, is, isn't that, would you have guessed that at the start of Corona that that would happen? I wouldn't have guessed that, but I think that people are looking for happy moments and positivity during such like a dark, uncertain time. And, you know, if you know you want to marry somebody and you love them, you're spending a ton of time with them right now. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's, a nice like thing to do. I thought that the wedding bands specifically would like fall off a cliff because people are not having weddings. Yes. Um, and then it turned out people just bought them because they're not having a wedding. They want to feel good. And we've seen a lot of people <laughs> doing really small ceremonies or just like getting married just the Backyard, two of them kind of. Um, on their original wedding date, even if they had to postpone their actual wedding. So people are still like getting married, still getting engaged. Yeah, true. Like, I think it's nice. Like life goes on and there's still things to look forward to. Yeah. 20 people or 200 people, they're still yeah. getting a ring. So, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So a question I like to ask, and, and I think over time I've started to gather a lot of founders, almost every founder is like, I love, I love being a founder. I wouldn't trade it. Like it's the best experience, but it's so difficult. Like it's such a hard thing to do. If you were to sum up why it's so hard, well, Hey, do you think it's super, super hard? And, and if so, why do you think it, what makes it so hard? I think it's hard, but it's a privilege, you know, um, it's a privilege to have something that like you care enough about that's hard. Now, a lot of people do very hard work that, you know, they're on their feet all day, you know, mopping floors or something like we're, we're doing something that's hard that that's for us and that we enjoy doing. And that we're passionate about and we can, the effort that we put in, we can see that payoff is yeah, but it's a privilege and it's the best it's the best kind of hard work yeah. possible. That's, that's a really good way to put it. A few questions, like a little less related to the business, but would love to get your take on. So one's around trends. So I imagine you guys, you know, you're, you're reading a lot, you're, you're experiencing a lot of different things happening. What are some market trends that you're seeing either as a consumer or like if you were an investor, you'd be like, wow, so much to jump on that that are exciting to you right now. Outside of jewelry? Could be jewelry or beauty or outside tech. Well, anything. I think, um, COVID has really exacerbated trends that were slowly catching on. So I'm so happy we always had the idea to be remote and virtual. And I think in all sorts of aspects of retail that, you know, people are going to be more comfortable not going into a physical retail store and doing things like online and virtually. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that's something that's just like, if you didn't have an online presence before this, like you kind of got caught with your pants down. Or if you double down on physical retail, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a trend, um, where, where, you know, the idea, like Olivia mentioned earlier, like the perfectly manicured, like avocado toast, whatever, like that's kind of over and people are like craving authenticity and personalization. And you see with like all these youngsters on social media and TikTok, like nothing should be like that perfect. And like everyone likes being like real and authentic and like 
you know, their true selves. Um, I also think that not related to jewelry, but like anything like in cybersecurity is probably a a really great trend if you were investing money in right now. Yeah, even something we even pay more attention to than than we used to and probably should pay a lot more attention to. A A question on that around like the remote and you guys building this platform. Will the experience for someone let's say like similar demographics, but like I'm from Ohio. So like someone from Ohio versus someone in New York, is your remote experience going to be very similar or will you be able to like almost customize that based on, you know, the differences between those two markets? Yeah. I mean, the, I think the different markets have slightly different trends. Like, like I, I think in Texas, everything's bigger. Like that's a real thing. It is a real <laughs> thing. <yeah. laughs> um, so I think it's just like an, our, our gemologists and our institutional knowledge aware of those trends. Like, oh, this one's from Ohio. Like not like prejudging them or something, but if we pick up on a trend, be like, yeah, we've seen a lot of this. You know, one of our biggest markets was Alabama in the beginning. Um, and we recognize some trends there. But I, our goal is to really, if you're from Ohio or New York or LA or Dallas, you get the same experience. Whether you're spending $5,000 or $500,000, you get the same experience. And really democratizing that private jewelry experience and not having, you know, one person not have as elevated of an experience depending on where they are. Yeah, I think people find that hard to believe, but like genuinely like the $5,000 client in the Sometimes five... Sometimes we put more work I think we do. Those. I was going to say that. I think the, that client, we put a lot more work in than the half a million dollar client. Because if it's half a million dollars or if it's 475 or 525 it's different than if it's 10 or 2 for the five you know yeah <laughs> true it's all about relative to like what what they have yeah. yeah so a question around uh morning routine so do you guys have like specific morning routines and and what do they look like you know and what have you picked up or dropped over time so pre covid our morning routine was very different than currently. I did not have a morning routine. It was basically like sleep and snooze until like the last possible moment and then like run out the door. Um but now um I think we wake up, I make breakfast while you're answering emails, like it's pretty leisurely and then we hop on like a team call. Yeah, so now it's more structured um but I have no shame in saying that we were we're not morning people. No, we're, uh, we're in the office yeah, every. I mean, I'm not either. We're in the office every we'll day. We sleep until the last second. Yeah, we're in the office at eight forty five. Like she takes appointments sometimes at eight forty five. So we're in the office at eight thirty mm-hmm. at the latest, really. Um, but we don't enjoy that. No. <laughs> Yeah, status call at ten, roll out of bed at nine fifty five. I'd rather yeah. I'd rather, you know, stay up and work until like ten PM than yeah. wake up at eight. Question around like the products you like couldn't live without, both personal and, and for business. What's what's one product for each category, like your personal life that you use for leisure and then a business product that you just can't live without? So business product, I think Airtable. Uh, we do so much on Airtable. Um or Dropbox, I guess it's different. But Airtable allows us to do things that Google Sheets or Excel, anything like that, that doesn't really do it. It's, it's more collaborative than any of those. And I think it's also more um, visual. And I think both of those work well for what we do. And my ca- my Google Calendar. <laughs> on the personal side? No, you, on the work No, Zan, on the personal side, though. You oh, have a lot of... On my personal side, things that I cannot live without are my silk eye mask and pillowcase. Nice. The sleep is key. Yeah. No, yeah, it's key. <laughs> so I got three more questions for you. The, the first one's around learning and resources. So for, for either aspiring entrepreneurs or just people who, you know, like learning about businesses, like learning about companies, are there any books, newsletters, podcasts, social media follows that you guys would recommend um, for those people? I mean, there's so many. I think um, the 20 Minute VC is a great podcast. I think How I Built This obviously is a great podcast. What inspired me um, before I started the Clear Cut, I really loved listening to Sofia Amoroso's Girl Boss, um, and those stories really helped me when I was starting. Yeah, but there's just so many resources out there. I think um, it's good to take inspiration from that, but you also don't need to overwhelm yourself with that. Like find something that you're into, and sometimes it gives you more inspiration if you read some fiction or like you're watching TV, like whatever it may be, like. Sometimes when we watch like your Bravo shows, like I'll be like, you know what? Like <laughs> so-and-so actually had like a good idea in terms of how she markets her business or whatever. So <laughs> it can come from anywhere. No, that's that's a great I, I totally agree too. Like creativity seems to never come when you're like sitting down exactly. trying to think about it. It just always comes. All right. So final two questions. We ask these to everybody on the show. Um, the first one is your startup manifesto. So if you had to write a startup manifesto with five of the most important key lessons or pitfalls to avoid when starting out, 
what would they be? The one we already talked about, we both agreed on the, if you're not embarrassed by your launch, you waited too long and to like do more faster. Yeah, that was Techstars like slogan. So we were about that. Was it don't wish for it, work for it. Yeah, that's, a lot of times you can, you know, think and wish and hope that you'll be doing something somewhere somehow. And you're like, oh, I could have done that. And like, see, they're doing it. And it's like, well, don't wish for it, like work for it, put your mind to it. Like I have so many friends and, you know, people that reach out to me that are like, oh, how do I get started? What do I do? I want to like start something. And it's like, well, I mean, I was bored and I just started a blog and there, yeah, there were tons of jewelry blogs. Like why would anyone read mine or like follow my Instagram? It's like, no one would know unless you just start it and try and see what happens. Like what's the worst that can happen? You're back at square one and nothing, it didn't work and you'll try something else. Be yeah. authentic. Be authentic. Um, believe in yourself. I think like a lot of pitfalls, like I was saying, there are so many people that are going to have opinions on your business and what you should do and think they know better. And a lot of times, you know, you should feel the confidence that if you really think that something is the right way that it should be done, you know, you don't have to listen to everyone. Sometimes you do know better than other people. Yeah. And I think in terms of, we mentioned this earlier, but like allow competition to help you craft your own voice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think competition is a double-edged sword where it can be um, unhealthy to pay attention to your comp competition too much. It shouldn't be consumed. With it shouldn't it. be consumed by it, but you should absolutely be aware of who they are and what they aren't and what you are and what they aren't. And I think you'll, if you're comfortable with that, then... You don't. You don't need to be jealous or envious or mean the other direction. It, have it motivate you. Yeah, to have be it better. motivate you. Yeah. No, that's. I think that's a really good list. So th thank you guys for that. The last question, which has been really successful for us, is the nomination. So it's it's your turn to nominate another founder that's either a friend, colleague, or mentor of yours that you'd like to see on the show. So we will nominate um, Alec Alec Khan, who is the founder and CEO of All True. They were a fellow tech stars. Um, company with us awesome um and we actually used their software um for our wednesday q a compilations but what they do is um they have this video service for um hr so and it, they're really really cool yeah and i think right now with covid i think they're crushing it um and they really like help brands humanize um their employees yeah that's awesome uh, i can't wait to have them on so before we wrap i just want to acknowledge you guys i think for you, your authenticity is really inspiring. I think sometimes when you see a social profile or social brand or community, it doesn't always live up to what you expect off the screen. And after talking to you guys, you're super authentic, humble, and uh, I think you're really onto something. So I'm I'm really excited to keep following along with the growth. Awesome, it means that a lot. That's so sweet. Yeah, thanks for sure. So I'm sure a ton of people are going to hear this and want to want to either contact you or follow you. So can you plug your personal and and the clear cut social? Yes. Follow us on the clear cut. It's at the clear cut on Instagram. And you can follow me personally at Olivia Landau. Um, what's your, you don't need to follow me personally, Mr. Kyle Simon. <laughs> um, it's just going to be behind the scenes of the clear cut action. Um, <laughs> follow us on TikTok at the clear cut as well. That's yes, growing. We've been nice. And that's, that's happening. <laughs> trying. And you there. can listen to Olivia's podcast, cozying up with the clear cut. Yes. Wherever, wherever podcasts are streamed. Awesome. Kyle Simon, Olivia Landau, founder of The Clear Cut. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for listening to that episode with Olivia Landau and Kyle Simon of The Clear Cut. Remember, if you liked what you heard and want to support the show, there's a couple quick things you could do that would really help us out. One, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe to the show. Please leave us a five-star rating and a couple sentence positive review on why the show inspired you. These ratings and reviews are super important and they signal to Apple that they should put our show in front of other people that might like it. Two, follow us on social, mainly Instagram, at Founder Podcast. Each week we put out teasers, audio clips, and important quotes from the episode. And lastly, check out our website as a mission control for the show. Go to thefounderpod.com. We have a page on there called Special Offers where we link up discount codes from our founders' companies, as well as all the books and resources that have been mentioned across all of our episodes. I hope you enjoyed that episode and are looking forward to the next one. Until then, I'm Callaway and this is The Founder.